a laptop. So uh, we're live. <coughs> Finally, oh, <laughs> we made it. We did. This is another episode of Fun.net. I'm Bertrand Leroy, and I'm here with Kendra. Hi, Kendra. Hello, everyone. And we have Glenn as well. Hi, Glenn. Hi. And we do have Michael with us. Hi, Michael. Hello, Bertrand, Kendra. Hi. So Michael works for Docker. That is so. I'm a product manager at, uh, at Docker. Um, and I, at Docker, I work on a lot of the stuff that we do with Microsoft. Uh, so I've been super busy um, making sure that the launch of Windows Server 2016 with container support and Docker was, was great. And I also work with Glenn and other people who do .NET stuff as, um, um, to help them uh, create great doc, um, Docker experiences for, for .NET developers. Excellent. So um, before we dive into that, uh, maybe it's actually useful to, um, to explain uh, maybe some of our viewers who have heard about containers but are not necessarily familiar with them. Uh, what is so compelling about, about containers? Why, why should people care? I mean, we talk a, a lot about it, but what is it? Why? why? Yeah, so depending on, depending on your job, you're, you're probably going to care for different reasons. But um, for example, if, if you're a developer, uh, containers are really great because they're, uh, containers are a way to kind of take an, take an app or a piece of source code or, or some other piece of software that you want to run and then kind of package it up in, in a container image. Um, and the great thing about doing that is that once once you've gone to the trouble of creating a container image, um, you you can take that image and deploy it again and again, uh, dependably on on any any system that has a container runtime, and and you know it's going to run um, because uh, you're not dependent on the system first having been configured with just the right software and just the right registry settings to to make it run. All all of all of that. All of those dependencies and settings are encapsulated in, in the container image. Um, so it's a it's a control environment, and that does that mean that it works on my machine is no longer a good excuse. And now you can say mm -hmm. it works on my container, so you know it's going to run everywhere. Exactly. So uh, it, it really solves that. Uh, it worked on my machine problem, like where you uh, you're a developer and you you configure your system just right, and your software compiles on your system. But then once your colleague checks out the source code it doesn't run because there's a DLL missing or it's not the right version. Um, with, uh, if, if, you, if you build a, write a Docker file and, and create a, a container image, there's now kind of a dependable, repeatable, repeatable way to, to package up that app and, and, um, and, and run it um, independent of what else is, is on the system. Um, that it's, it's way easier to kind of maintain Say that you're maintaining two different apps, and maybe they require different versions of IIS or different versions of SQL Server or the .NET framework, uh, and maybe they re even require settings on the system that are mutually incompatible. So previously, it used to be super complicated to go back and forth between those two apps because you had to configure your system to run and then you changed over. With containers, all, all of that, all of that complexity can just kind of live live inside of the container, and you can. You can run two containers side by side on the same system with completely different um, uh, .NET frameworks, IIS versions, um, all this stuff. One one of the containers can even like blow up the registry or or uh, erase the entire um, file system inside of the container. But because the containers are, are isolated and sandboxed, it doesn't affect the host and it doesn't affect other containers running running on that system. The, so, the, the benefits so of isolation and done. Um, yeah. Sorry. So, uh, from what you're saying, it sounds like you get a lot of the benefits from a virtual machine. So, how yeah. does it differ from a virtual machine? Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Uh, you kind of get the, the sandboxing and isolation benefits of virtual machines. But the nice thing about containers is that they're uh, they're a lot more lightweight than than virtual machines. Um, so, with virtual machines, you'll uh, you, you kind of virtualize the hardware. So if you have two virtual machines running on, on the same host, they, they kind of each have a, like a virtualized piece of hardware and they run a full operating system kernel and they have a full operating system user land with all the DLLs and, and, and all that stuff. Um, so it's, it's pretty heavyweight uh, and, and virtual machines are kind of un, unwieldy. They're, they're hard to move around and they take, they take a long time to, to start up and, and stop. Um, with 
with containers, only only the operating system is is virtualized. So um, so what that means is that if you have two containers running on the same host, they actually share the kernel with the host and and which with each each other, um, but the, the file system and registry and process context is, is isolated so so that they don't interfere with one another but that may, means that they're that they're way more efficient um, in terms of kind of packing density and like starting starting a container on Linux it's very fast on on Windows with um, with the new implementation it's still it's still pretty fast it takes like uh, less than a second to, to start up a container versus virtual machines that might take uh, like minutes uh, minutes or even longer to start up mm -hmm. so so what that means is that it's actually feasible to have like in your kind of F5 day-to-day -day, uh, development workflow, um, building building and starting and stopping containers is fine. Uh, it's, it's fast enough that, that, that you typically don't notice. There was, there's been a few examples we've seen um, around the place where people are spinning up an entire con a container just to do like a one job and then, and then spinning it down again. Um, whereas you would typically would not hear of anybody saying, oh, we're just going to spin up a virtual machine in order to do this one task and then turn off the virtual machine at the end. Um, people kind of do that, but nowhere near as frequently as you see that sort of thing happening with containers because they just start so quickly. Um, one uh, side effect of that is that that is kind of maybe not so obvious is that you really notice it when your application starts really slowly because you know the container starts in a second or something like that, sub-second in many cases. So when your application now takes five seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds to start, it becomes really obvious that your application is slowing down the world, you know? So now uh, it's your fault. Well, it's somebody's fault between the container and the, and the you know, front, whatever, the, whatever is happening. Um, it might be our fault in .NET. It might be your fault. It might be somebody's fault. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so, and so, so in, in addition to kind of the, the resource benefits of, of not having hardware virtualized um, container images, um, they also, so this is a little bit different between Windows and Linux, but um, they're, they're typically also a lot smaller than, than full VM images. Um, so, uh, and also um, the way Docker works is that um, Docker tries to be smart about the, the kind of layering of, um, of container images. So, um, so container images typically end up being also easier to move around. Like it's people, people typically don't, well, what they do, I guess, but uh, it's, it's kind of laborious, but it's um, it, you, like it's complicated and laborious and bandwidth heavy to share full VM images, but it's actually a pretty good experience with, uh, with uh, Docker containers. So for example, Doc, Docker runs something called Docker Hub, which is uh, it's kind of, it's like, it's like GitHub just for, for kind of pre-built container images. And you can you can pull, push and pull um, container images, uh, including stuff like SQL Server, um, and it's it's not painful. Or 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 an image that has the, the .NET framework in it, for example, and it's, yeah. it it works. As a concrete example of that, uh, today you can go to Docker Hub and you can pull either uh, .NET 3.5 or 4.5.2 Windows containers if you're running the latest versions of Windows or .NET Core images that are running on either Windows or um, Linux and, AS, and as well as ASP.NET specific flavors of those things. So there's an ASP.NET ASP Core image and, a, and an ASP.NET image that's for um, you know, Net 4.5.2 ASP.NET and ASP.NET Core for ASP.NET Core. Now what that means is you could build an application that, as I say, an ASP.NET Core application for, for the sake of the discussion. And you say in your Docker file for your application, you say from Microsoft slash ASP.NET Core, I want to use the ASP.NET Core image as the base of my application image. I copy my application binaries in, and then I start up my app, and that's your Docker file, basically. If you build that image for your application, and then you run it on a machine, then it uses all the stuff we pre-built in that Docker Hub image. And if you start five or 10 instances on that machine, all of those layers from the, the we provided in the ASP.NET Core image, they're all shared across all of those instances. And if another team or someone else is using this same hardware to run a different ASP.NET Core application, but they are coming from the same ASP.NET Core base image on the same server, they're probably, they're gonna share these like same underlying base, these underlying layers as well. Um, so you can gain, because 
everything other than the very topmost level, topmost layer for your application is specific is is read only. It means Docker can take advantage of that and share many many files on disk, um, which is really nice. And it means it so it means that you deploy the first one and you pull down the whole image, which might be a hundred or two hundred megabytes because it contains a bunch of Linux and stuff in it. And then the next one is only, you know, 10 megabytes because all the rest of those layers are shared and the next and so on and so forth. Um, and that's very difficult to achieve with something like virtual machines. Yes. It, it also sounds like the benefits to a cloud, and cloud environment such as Azure are absolutely tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, the example then, so you, we've kind of talked about Docker just, just as Docker. Um, when you start talking about cloud or you start talking about scaling, and then you also have uh, this concept of an orchestrator where I've got five machines and I want to just spread my containers out across those five machines and, have, and I, want, you know, I want that to happen. Um, and in, in the Docker ecosystem, there are orchestrators, including, including one that from Docker now, right? Um, that uh, where you can effectively configure it to say, here are my five application images here, and here's, these are my five machines, go. And it will yeah. spread them out across your five machines. And if a machine dies, it'll you know, start up a new one on another machine so that there's always some number of these containers available to service your, your users all the time. Yeah, and that kind of leads in. So uh, before we covered uh, some of the advantages for, for developers of, of uh, using containers, um, but this kind of gets into what, what are the benefits uh, for, for ops and, and operations people. Yeah. And, and one of the neat things there is that kind of container images can serve as a, as a really good contract between developers and ops because you, you get rid of that flow where a, like a developer takes a new dependency, there's a new DLL required or something. And then to put that new version of the software into production, they have to communicate with the operations team and say, hey, remember before deploying this on all the servers, go add this DLL or tweak this setting. Yeah. Um, and instead, uh, instead the contract can be the the contract can be the um, the, the container image, and and ops can kind of be confident and know that uh, okay, uh, our CI infrastructure built this container image, tests were run on it. I know that this is a good deployment artifact, and it ships with all everything that's required to run it. Um, yeah. And they they can then deploy it uh, on Azure or or on prem. Uh, or wherever they like, uh, as long as there's a container runtime uh, on, the, on that system. Yeah, it simplifies, the, it's, while still making the life better for a developer, and we can talk about the many, many use cases where it makes life good for the developer, it also simplifies lives for the ops guy. Um, it goes back to the container kind of metaphor that Docker is built around. If you see the Docker logo and all of the Docker things, they'll have these shipping containers, right? Um, and when you, the reason that, like, that that shipping container metaphor is so strong and so powerful is when you make shipping containers became amazing, were amazing once every port in the world knew how to handle a standard shipping size yeah. container of, 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 the, of the three sizes, I think they have, or the, the, the few sizes, then the cost per, um, you know, kilogram of cargo to ship went from dollars to like, Three cents or something. I can't yeah, remember exactly what the numbers were. How, right. how the the standard container uh, enabled the, the 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 commerce of the world in a way that is completely incredible. And yeah, I like to tell this. Great metaphor, yes. I like to tell this story when I when I moved to America. Um, I came here from Australia, and I had a shipping container. Like the people came to my house and they loaded all of my stuff, and they put it on a container. And yeah, they put they put your life in a little box. In a little box, right? <laughs> now the now if there was no shipping container, then how that would have worked is I would have had to like pack all my stuff into cardboard boxes, right? Then some guys have to like pack all of those into a truck somehow. Then they have to take them to the docks, and then they have to like pack them into a boat somehow in some way, and then they have to take the boat to America and stuff like that, right? Now, instead, all of the stuff went into a container just near my house, and then I don't even know how it got to America. Uh, and I never right. cared, right? It just magically appeared one day. It could have been on yeah. a train. It could have been on a boat. It could have been on a plane. Train, I have no a idea. Truck, then and a boat. Yeah, the that's right. Train again. Yeah. yeah. And, and everybody in the middle, all they they didn't know what was inside my container, and they didn't care either. They just knew that they had a shipping container and it needed to go somewhere over there. And they knew how to handle shipping containers. They do that all day. Yeah, so to get back to software, uh, <laughs> I, have, I have deployed so many web applications to so many different web hosts, 
uh, and and they used to be all different. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge problem. If you had an application running with with some host and you wanted to change to another company, that was a huge problem because you had to rework all your uh, deployment infrastructure. You yeah. usually and potentially the like you know you just you got to a situation where you couldn't share like two applications could not physically live on the same machine right yes would happen which would that be bad too, yeah. as well because that cost you more money you now had to pay for a whole new server just to run this one application because it happened to use yep. you know x version of something that fought with the other versions of that thing on the other applications needed you know? yeah um and yeah those problems are absolutely can be solved by by containerizing your applications so uh, the, the benefits are quite clear, but how difficult is it to create your own Docker image? It's yeah, I don't know if uh, if you, if you want, I can I can share my screen and and, and show some take this, uh, uh, some short demos. Okay, let's see how that works. Um, so I joined on my I'm joined as uh, on my laptop also in addition to my iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I, I'll switch to it as soon as you share your screen. Uh, oh, oh, it says screen share not supported in audio only mode. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Okay. I like that. You are screen sharing. That works. Cool. Okay. Look, it's an inception of Bertrand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you yeah, see all right? Yeah, perfect. We can see it. Okay. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So what I have here is uh, it's actually just um, kind of the um, uh, the music store app, uh, which is a prod prod ASP.NET MVC app uh, that can, it runs with a database and um, and uh, ASP.NET Core uh, web front end. Uh, so it's. It's just a good uh, good sample to show because it has a bit of complexity. Uh, so I checked that out here, and this is um, this is a sample that we built with Microsoft for the launch of Windows Server 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, so it runs on, on Windows containers. So the modifications I did here that I actually sent as a pull request to the Music Store project are just to add the few files required to uh, to start Docker uh, or containerizing the the app. Um, so you can see I have the source code here, and then I added a Docker file. And I added a Docker Compose file. So opening that in my editor, um, this is the Docker file that I'm looking at right now. I'm just going to see if I can. Do you guys remember how to change the syntax highlighting in uh, Visual Studio Code? On right corner, is it? No. No. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, let me just pop up the font also. Um, so a Docker file is is kind of the recipe recipe for building building a container um, so uh, it has a set of instructions uh, that uh, and each instruction results in a, in a layer in the docker image um, uh, that, that then uh, comprises uh, comprises the full container image um, so you can see in this docker file I start the first instruction is always from so I start with an image called Microsoft slash .net and then uh, attack uh, so this is just telling uh, uh, the Docker build that, uh, okay, I want to start from this base image that Microsoft built. Um, and in this case, it's a um, it's a base image that's based on nano server, kind of the new minimal uh, Windows version. And then it has uh, .NET Core in it. Um, then the next instruction, I just set up the shell so that the rest of the Docker file uses PowerShell. Uh, then I set a registry key that uh, is a workaround for a for a bug uh, that we're working on, <laughs> and then um, uh, I create I create a um, I create a directory to do my work in. So this will, like, with um, starting from the base layer, I just I basically just get kind of a, a fresh Windows install with .NET in it. So I create a, a music store a directory where where I can kind of do the, the work of compiling and building the app in. Then I copy in the project.json. So if you're familiar with .NET Core, the project.json is kind of the file that has, um, it, uh, it, it references all the NuGet packages and libraries that are required to, uh, to make this app go. Then I add the NuGet.config so that I have the um, kind of uh, NuGet repo information. And then I can run the .NET restore command. Um, so with that, I can copy in the rest of the app and then I can run .NET build 
so this is like exactly what you would do if you were uh, building building a .NET Core app uh, just from the CLI. Uh, this is just kind of built into a recipe that Docker can follow. Then I um, let Docker know that this image will be exposing port 5000. And finally, the command incantation to, that's supposed to be invoked when this container image is run is .NET run, um, which will then start the web app. Um, so I can go uh, back to my prompt. I'm just going to bump up the font here also. Like so. Um, so I can now do uh, Docker Compose. Um, let's see. Docker Compose uh, build, and you see I pass in the file argument. This is actually not required. This is because I named my Docker Compose file something. But the important thing is uh, I run Docker Compose build. Um, so what this will do is um, uh, basically uh, Docker is not going to start following that doc file to speak uh, and build uh, the web app. And because uh, I had built this previously, it was pretty fast uh, because um, Docker tries to be smart about caching. So it basically checks to see, okay, uh, I already uh, followed these instructions previously. Did anything change? Um, and if not, then I can just use the cache. Yeah. So this was uh, pretty fast. Interestingly, for those of uh, watching who have like used this stuff before, um, he's doing he did a .NET restore there somewhere in here, and um, when he ran it when he ran build just then he didn't actually do a restore because Docker knew that the project JSON hadn't changed and so it didn't need to do the restore because it already had all the files as the output of that restore operation. It's completely cached due to Docker's level caching. Um, yep. But if he ever did change his project JSON, the restore would run again. So he yep. basically never has to do that to restore unless he he can keep running restore as much as he likes and it never does anything unless he changes his project JSON inside. Yeah. Docker. So so to get, to get a little bit into the weeds, that's kind of why this is split up. Like first I copy copy in the project of JSON and then I copy in the rest of the source code. Yeah. Um, so what that gets me is that if I make a change like just in a view or in a controller, um, Docker will notice. Uh, okay, the controllers and all this stuff changed, but that was actually not in the container. When when I ran when I ran the restore command, so I can still use the cache layer that has the nuclear packages and just run the subsequent steps um, uh, without without having to run the restore. So it's a way to get kind of faster uh, incremental yeah. incremental builds. This and this Docker file looks a little bit complicated because it is restoring and compiling and building and running my application all in one thing. Um, you'll see much simpler Docker files out there if you assume that the application is already being compiled, for example, or if you want to do that, or if you build in a different container that's not this one, or things like that. Um, there are many, many different ways to use the um, to, to use Docker. So, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, so what you'll see, a lot of the Microsoft uh, um, tooling will, um, actually because it's, it's fairly easy to build portable .NET apps, uh, you just do the compilation on the host system. Yeah, um, and then then you create the container by taking the output of the compiled uh, DLN and, and placing it in a in a container image. Yeah, um, there are, then, there are some advantages to that, right? Like it means that the compiler is not in the production image, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the neat thing about this is that you can actually demo a .NET app without having .NET or anything else installed on on the host system. Uh, every, everything is uh, is built in Docker. But yeah, yeah. both uh, both the ways uh, both ways work. Yep. Okay, so taking a look at the Docker Compose file. So the Docker file was kind of the recipe for building my music store app into a container image. The Compose file is um, it's a description of, uh, okay, so to run this app, I'm going to need a couple of services running. One is the image that I just built, and another one is the SQL Server uh, image that um, the mu that music store uh, uses to, to uh, store uh, data. Um, so you can see the second uh, service entry here is the web, uh, the web one, and you see it just builds uh, the Docker file that I specified before. The first service is the PB service, and uh, I don't. Uh, that's not going to get built. I'm just going to use a, a, a an image from Docker Hub. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Python SQL Server image, um, and then I pass in some environment and I set up the ports. Um, and then uh, I can go run Docker Compose up. Uh, and what's going to happen now is that um, 
Docker will first spin up uh, the DB container, and then it'll spin up the web container and um, hook up the network between them. Uh, and hopefully the, the, app, the app will start running. Um, yeah, yep. We started my system, so it might uh, just yeah. a minute. So if you think about this for a second, you now with one file and one command have spun up three independent components of your application, what is like logically three separate machines effectively. And they can all talk to each other and they can mimic exactly your production environment to as close a fidelity as you can, you can achieve, basically. Um, and we all know uh, how long it takes to install SQL Server. <laughs> yes. In this case yeah. now, SQL Server takes, uh, I want to say it's like 10 seconds or 20 seconds to, to boot and be ready to receive connections inside yeah, a container. Yeah, I can show so, that. Uh, uh, so like, you're, you're deploying code and you're deploying SQL Server. Uh, what about deploying data? Uh, is there a story around that as well? So, um, so with this with this example, basically the, the SQL Server database is uh, the database files are just in the con in the SQL Server container, mm -hmm. which is great for development. Like uh, I tear I, I set up a new SQL Server, I, I do some testing, and then when I control C or do Docker compose down, it just all gets uh, torn down and, and goes away. Um, if you are if you are it to be more persistent, then um, Docker basically supports. What you can do is you can mount a Command a directory from the host file system, which is like uh, persistent. You can then map that into a, a container, and then the container will just operate on a, a mounted uh, mounted directory. And then, even if the container shuts down, the the change the file system changes are still there on the host. Yeah. Uh, so that that's how you do a kind of more persistent stuff. It's also fairly easy, like if, particularly with ASP.NET Core or .NET Core. Uh, if you use our default config system, we automatically load. The, uh, we will automatically let you override configuration via environment variables. And the only thing that differentiates connecting to this SQL Server container versus, say, an instance of SQL Azure, is the connection string. So it's actually fairly easy if he went to his Docker Compose file and removed the SQL SQL image and instead defined an environment variable. See there where he's got environment in his web, he's got data, default connection, connection string, server DB. If he just changes that connection string to be his SQL Azure connection string, when this web container starts, it will connect to SQL Azure instead, right? Um, which means you, he could have this set up as his perfect development environment and it's always got exactly the right set of test data that he needs to do all of his stuff. And then in production, they just set that environment variable and it goes to some other thing, SQL Azure, say, or, you know, or not. Like if you want to put it in containers, that's fine too. Yeah. So, yeah, now um, my, uh, my music star app is, uh, is up um, and uh, I can uh, click around. And this is all running, uh, running inside of containers. Um, yeah, and as mentioned, I, uh, I actually don't have SQL Server installed in this system. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do have .NET installed, but I wouldn't have to if I didn't want to. So yeah. Um, yes. The whole kind of, the whole kind of, also like just for developer onboarding, like getting if you have a new guy joining your team, um, like where it used to be, maybe he had to spend half a day mm -hmm. setting up a system, installing SQL yeah. Server, um, tweaking IS, figuring out how all that works. Yeah. Uh, you, you can now just kind of tell them to check out the source code and make sure Docker is there, and they can have a good experience um, running running that code immediately. Yeah, so I use this a lot um, for trying stuff out or running things on my machine that I don't necessarily want to install on my machine. Uh, the example that I remember the other day is I was trying out the Python Azure CLI, which required you know Python three or something. Or it required Python anyway, and I didn't have Python. And so I didn't really want to install Python. So instead I said Docker run Azure CLI, and then I had a container running the Azure CLI. And then when I uninstalled the Azure CLI, I said Docker RM Azure CLI, and it was gone. And there was absolutely nothing left on my machine from that thing. There was no registry keys or broken uninstaller that forgot to remove a file or whatever. But um, to be fair to Python, they have a virtual environment. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was mostly just that was kind of an example, right? Like replace replace Azure CLI and Python with Postgres SQL or Redis yeah. or SQL yeah. Server, yeah. Um, and you and the same thing applies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I'm what I'm doing in this shell right now, uh, I'm actually just spinning up new instances of SQL Server and in containers, and you can see 
it takes about a it takes about a second or two to to start to start a completely fresh uh, SQL Server container. And those mm -hmm. are like those are it's not like different databases uh, in the same SQL Server. They're completely Independent. functioning installs of, yeah. of SQL Server yeah. Express. And if like one of one of my coworkers went in and nuked one of these, it would not it would not affect uh, affect any of the others. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot earlier too. My uh, my like ten second time I said earlier for SQL was actually full SQL Server on Linux in a container, not uh, not SQL Express on Windows. So the times are very different. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually really neat. I think that did that happen today. Yeah. Uh, did. SQL Server on Linux. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, people following this might, you probably know that uh, SQL Server is coming to Linux uh, and it's been in private beta for a while, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's gotten more public now. And, and one of the ways that you can run SQL Server on Linux is just by using uh, a container from Docker Hub. So Microsoft, yeah. the Microsoft SQL Server team ships a Docker container um, with SQL Server installed. And it's, yeah, yeah I, I used it a bunch, it's just super neat. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess to bring this back to uh, bring all of these threads back to a concrete work or example, I guess, or flow. Um, one of the things that I talked about in a talk at Ignite with Steve Lasker was we had a .NET Core application building on a CI server, just a normal build, the same as you would have today, probably. Um, if you were building a .NET Core application today, and pushing it to a to a Linux server in this case, it didn't have to be. Um, and we shipped the new version of .NET, .NET 1.0.1. And so on stage, we said, you know, what would be a great idea to go and update all of our applications to uh, to, to explicitly specify 101, right, in our, in our project JSONs. So we did that, and then we said, works great on our machine, and we pushed it to source control, and then the build to the server broke because it didn't have .NET 1.01 installed on it. And so we but in used changed our build to instead of just building on the server to build inside of a container. We still didn't containerize our app in that we didn't we weren't running it with containers in production. We were still running it exactly the same way we've always run it. But we just began to introduce Docker into our workflow by saying we're going to compile inside a container, drop the binaries onto disk, and then otherwise deploy in a traditional manner as our first step. And by doing that, we immediately removed the situation where I forgot to install something on my build agent and I have to go talk to the ops guy to get install the thing because I decided to use it in my application, right? That problem completely disappeared from my dev flow. You know, and everybody in the room put their hand up when I asked if you've had the situation where you forgot to install something on a build agent. So this is a, this is a very common problem. So it also um, changes everything for continuous integration, but that also applies to testing in itself, maybe there are yeah. testing scenarios that you wouldn't implement before because they are flaky because they need a lot of environment set up. Now you can do it in a container and you don't get all those problems because you are again in the controlled environment. As you saw with the Docker Compose up just there, it was trivial for Michael to spin up three containers so that the system exactly mimicked what was going to be happening in production. And you can also imagine him now spinning up a fourth container which ran tests against the other containers, for example. So you yep. could say he could have a test container added to his Docker Compose file, and when he does Docker Compose up, that one starts up, and it just does you know HTTP requests against the main application, and it does like a full end-to-end -end integration of a couple of synthetic transactions or something like that. Um, you yeah. could totally implement that, and it would be fair, and it would and it would work. And then yeah, you could have that as your gateway. Yeah, we definitely see like one of the earliest use cases for a lot of people at adopting containers is is exactly CI because kind of the task of maintaining CI environments uh, just becomes way simpler. Like the, rest, the the source code always ships with a recipe for building uh, building a kind of standalone system that that can run it. And um, as Glenn, or as you mentioned, um, running more complicated CI tests is also simpler because like for example, if, if usually if I were testing this, I might have like I might have a kind of in-memory database option that I use to test uh, because uh, otherwise it just, just gets too complicated to run CI tests against some external SQL server um, that has to be cleaned up and, and torn down and so on. In this case, uh, I just spin up a full fresh SQL server container and, and run, run the tests against that. And it's going to get very good kind of dev CI prod parity. Uh, it's, the, the environment is, is, is very similar to, to where this will ever run in production. Yeah, and the so and uh, 
to thinking of the people who are watching this. Um, it's not limited to .NET Core, um, same as it's not limited to Linux. Um, if you look at the Connect videos where we're filming, we're recording this on the day of Connect, right? Um, and if you go look at the videos for that, you'll see Windows containers and you'll see uh, I think I recorded a video, a very short video, which showed web forms running inside a Windows container. So you can, this CI, CD flow that were improvements and testing improvements we're talking about, you could do that today with your current MVC, web forms, .NET console applications. Um, or as long as you, the only caveat is that you will have to upgrade to the newest versions of Windows in order to get the container features, um, which, which is, which is it. And then you'll be able to yeah. do all of this stuff with all of your .NET applications. Yeah, so there's a bunch of uh, great, Microsoft is publishing a bunch of great uh, container images on Docker Hub. Uh, I forget, Len, is one mm -hmm. of these, uh, does that have the full .NET framework? Yeah, there is um, ASP.NET without core has full framework. And uh, yeah, I think there's also .NET framework is the other one that has just .NET. The difference between the two is that ASP.NET has IIS and ASP.NET registered, whereas the other, whereas the .NET one just has just, just .NET if you're not using IIS and, and ASP.NET. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, yes. So you could go and grab this image now and you could use .NET 462 or 35 and put deploy an application into it and it would run. Um, or you could just build your application in it and otherwise deploy it the same way. And then you could have your build agents be truly um, kind of ignorant of what it is that they're building. And you don't have to have th two different build agents with the two different flavors of .NET because, you know, one environment only has 3.5 and the other environment only has 4.5.2 or 4.6.2 or whatever the, the setup is that you have. I remember historically having many build agents and all, the, all with slightly different things on them for the different various applications I build. And you could collapse all of that down to, you know, one or two build agents and only have build agents based on capacity instead of build agents based on mixtures of technology, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so um, going back to the um, uh, images that uh, Microsoft publishes, uh, mm -hmm. there's both um, there's both uh, Windows uh, uh, Windows based uh, images. So it, like literally the the kind of canonical base layers for Nano Server and Windows Server Core are on Docker Hub. Yeah. But uh, for example, for uh, .NET Core, um, uh, Microsoft publishes both uh, Windows base layers or, or base images, but also um, Ooh, was this the right one? This one's Windows Server Core. Oh, okay. Sorry. XP Net Core uh, or, or just... Yeah, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Um, so that um, if you're on a Mac or on Windows and you like using Docker there and you also want to try out uh, uh, .NET Core or ASP.NET ASP Core, um, you can use uh, Docker to do that. Uh, yeah. That's great. That's great uh, Linux-based uh, base layers on, on Docker Hub from Microsoft also. Yep. Yeah, we produce, um, we produced, yeah, .NET 3.5, .NET 4.6.2, IIS, um, ASP.NET for 3.5 and 4.6.2, uh, ASP.NET Core on Linux, .NET on Linux, .NET on Nano and more .NET. And .NET, when I said .NET those last two times, I meant .NET Core. Um, the name of the thing, I believe, is .NET when it's .NET Core. Um, and... There's also several other images produced by other people at Microsoft. Like you saw, there was a Microsoft OMS container, which is a container you can deploy to a cluster, which will take, which will monitor con containers running in your contest cluster and push them to like Microsoft Azure, like monitoring and like a whole bunch of stuff that people are pushing in here. You can see the SQL Server images, um, and you can grab all of these with just Docker. Here, there's, an, there's an interesting thing there. Uh, we saw uh, .NET Docker .NET Nightly. I think was it was somewhere back there. Um, .NET Nightly is um, the nightly builds of the .NET of .NET Core. So if you want to try out a nightly build of .NET Core without like you know risking the world because the nightly build of .NET Core might break something, you could go and just run the container and try it out, and then delete the container when you're done. Yeah. Should I should I so try that right now? See you all. <laughs> Uh, sure. on, on the Docker Hub, uh, I have a question about licensing. How does that work? Because you, you have SQL Server images in there. Mm. How do you deal with the licensing of SQL Server here? So, uh, so I've been using, I've just been demoing uh, SQL Server Express, uh, and I suspect that's OK. Uh, I actually built yes. and published some SQL Server Express images uh, early on. Um, 
for for full SQL Server, uh, I don't actually know what it's uh, for the Linux one. What the licensing is? Uh, I guess it's a beta, so you can yeah, I don't know just try it out. Yeah, it depends on what the thing is that you're talking about, basically. Yeah. Um, I think you know. I'm not. I'm not sure. I I can't talk authoritatively about any of the licensing stuff, unfortunately. But so for the at least for Windows containers, uh, the the um, for Windows containers, the license kind of travels with the host uh, that's running uh, that's running the Windows container. So that's if you true. have a if you have a Windows 10 host or Windows Server 2016 host, uh, you can run as many containers as you want on that, yeah. and and they just derive from the from the single yeah. uh, license that you already have for the host. Yeah, and I, be I believe the same. I believe a very similar model exists for Red Hat. Um, you register your Red Hat host, and then you can run many containers on your Red Hat host. I believe that's the same licensing model that they have um, for for accessing. So you register the host, and then as long as you've registered the host, that gives you access to you know the Red Hat repositories and stuff like that. Um, they have a slightly different world when you get into Red Hat on Linux, but um, but many of the same things apply. Yeah, excellent. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't know specifically about SQL Server, but the Windows licensing we covered. <laughs> uh, was anything new announced today about Docker? Uh, yes. There were many things new today announced about Docker. Do we want to talk about them? Yes. Why are asking? This is a leading question. Tell me all the new <laughs> things. Uh, so today we saw a CI and CD flow on Azure to Azure Container Service from Visual Studio. So you could publish, you could basically, you could create in Azure a, um, a, a it would, we would pre-build a CI CD flow with VSTS and deploy to Azure Container Service. So you could create all of those stuff and then from Visual Studio you just do like git commit and then it compiles your source code, builds a container and deploys the container to Azure Container Service. Um, I believe we're showing debugging into containers. So you press F5 inside Visual Studio and you hit a breakpoint inside the container, inside Visual Studio on your machine. So it's like this amazing experience where I'm inside, on like Windows inside Visual Studio and I press F5 and my application hits a breakpoint on a Linux VM inside a Linux container. So you can have really crazy things like I'm, I've got a Debian container running on an Alpine virtual machine on a Windows computer inside and I'm hitting a breakpoint right the um, things like that um, that you that you be able that you'll be able to see um, yeah it's been uh, it was uh, there was a whole if you watch all of the if you I'm assuming that you can watch all of the keynotes um, yeah. yeah they're available yeah. on connect event.microsoft.com I believe uh, yeah I put the link and um, the other thing that we announced that was really cool um, there's a that there's a post about here now, so I was just checking to make sure that there was a post about it and that I was allowed to uh, to talk about it. Um, was uh, Linux supporting containers? Linux AS app services supporting containers. So you can create an app service inside Azure, the web web app, mm -hmm. um, Antares perhaps for Bertrand, um, <laughs> and you can. We announced we announced a little while ago that we had a Linux version of that, and now you can also when you create one of the this Linux previews, you can just say, "I want you to run this Linux-based container," and when your app service starts, it'll just go pull that container and run it for you. Mm. Yeah, great. I believe and, that was uh, something that Scott Guthrie was going to show. Yeah, and sure. uh, SQL Server on Linux, of course. Um, yeah, and SQL Server on Linux, which tangentially is related to Docker in that you can get Docker containers with SQL Server and Linux on them. Yeah. Yeah, I found it on, on Docker Hub now. It's uh, it's right here. Yeah, nice. MS SQL Server dash Linux. Let me switch yeah. your screen. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I also did, you... uh, uh, since, yeah, since you were, uh, uh, Glenn mentioned how easy it was to try out the nightly version of the .NET Framework, so I just, um, Pull that image, and I can do dot run. And so nice. this, now I have I have an interactive shell inside of a nano server container uh, with that version of the .NET framework. Um, yeah, and see how he has yeah some really uh, really light really yeah some really new preview three version of .NET on in that in that in that image. Yeah, yeah. Simple set. Very yeah. cool. Very very cool. Anything else that you want to mention? 
Um, hmm. Don't think so. You should try all of the Docker stuff. Yeah, maybe tell uh, us about we, it. We can we can uh, mention how to how to get started. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in uh, Windows containers, um, you can actually uh, install Docker for Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so Docker for Windows is kind of a, a piece of software that Docker ships that sets up a Docker development environment on your machine. And um, if you choose the beta channel, we set up both. You, we set you up on Windows for both Linux and Windows uh, container uh, development. So yeah. basically, the, the Windows containers can run directly yeah. on Windows 10. You should you should definitely grab the beta if you want Windows. It's the best mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Um, okay. And th and then um, the way the way I happen to run um, containers on this system is actually I went and got the eval of Windows Server 2016, and then I just run that in a Hyper V VM. Mm -hmm. um, it so right now we're still working out some kinks in, in Windows containers, but so I just feel like I get the fastest uh, experience uh, doing this. Yeah. But it's pretty pretty simple to set up. By default, you won't have that. You'll just be kind of it'll be kind of transparent to you, and you'll just be running on Windows, assuming you have the latest anniversary update of Windows 10. If you're running on Windows 10, um, you need either Windows 10 anniversary update or the latest anniversary update patches or um, Server 2016 for Windows containers. For Linux containers, you'll you'll you they'll they always have a VM because they're Linux containers. So you need to be on a Linux machine. Yeah, uh, yeah. So all that is available on docs.docker.com, mm -hmm. and MSDN has a virtualization section that also has great content on building uh, Windows containers. Yep, and then um, you should then go and get Visual Studio tools for Docker. If you search for them, you should be able to find them. Um, they will let you do things like right click on an ASP.NET Core application and um, yeah, so that, that link there. So if you go grab those and put them into Visual Studio, you'll be able to right click on an ASP.NET Core application and say like add Docker support. That'll drop you, you know, some getting started Docker file and it'll also make Visual Studio be able to F5 into a container. And so you'll be able to hit breakpoints and kind of debug and stuff like that. Um, I believe this stuff is built into the um, to the uh, future versions of, of of Visual Studio. Yeah, excellent. And yeah, I run uh, so I actually run uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, and that mm -hmm. that works well too. Uh, yep. I think there's also a plugin for uh, Docker there. Um, you certainly get you guys still. You certainly get syntax highlighting for everything now. Oh, right. um, I believe there is some ideas, but I don't know if anything has been built okay. for Visual Studio Code yet um, from us. Uh, there is also Yeoman. Uh, there was a, there's a there was an old Yeoman generator to generate Docker files, but I don't know how up to date it is. Certainly, if you use uh, Yeoman to generate ASP.NET Core apps, they come with Docker files that you can play around with by default as well. So if you've got Docker set up and you do yo doc yo ASP.NET, then you'll get a Docker file and you'll be able to try out Docker build there. Um, if you're not in Visual Studio or something like that, um, there's also examples on the readmes on Docker Hub. So if you hit up Docker Hub and go to the ASP.NET Core or .NET um, images in the readmes on that page, they've got examples of Docker files and stuff like that. And I also think that Richard Lander, and I think I've owed him a sample for weeks now. Um, is setting up a Docker samples repository in the .NET org that has a bunch of examples of how to run .NET bot in various ways in Docker. It's basically yes, seven ways of running .NET bot on GitHub. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, lots of things to try. So <laughs> if you haven't tried uh, containers yet, now is a great time to begin, and you have all the the links in the description to do so. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's time to think in containers, and, uh, and then you'll be happy uh, for it. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, yep. Something like that hasn't popped up in in quite a while, actually. It's, yeah, uh, pretty soon. Soon you'll be like me, where everybody just says Docker to you when they're walking past, for that's because that's all you seem to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for being on uh, on the show. Uh, thanks that, for having us. This is great, and uh, I hope it, it helps a lot of people out there. Uh, so thanks, and bye everyone. Yeah, we'll see you, you again next bye. week. Bye. Oh, before we go, oh. we have oh. to steal. You, you're in the right room, Glenn. So we have to yeah. steal the, the the dramatic zoom out. Yeah. Oh, from the community stand up. <laughs>
Don't, yes. don't, don't tell Hanselman and... Uh, don't tell Hanselman, okay? No. Okay. no. Mom's the word. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>